Hey guys, thank you for choosing to hang out with me. This week we're discussing the case of Graham Frederick Young, a rather strange man with a fascination for poisons. He earned the moniker the teacup poisoner, so let's discuss why. I invite you to sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Graham Frederick Young was born on September 7, 1947 in Needston, located in North London, to his parents Bessie and Fred Young. His start in life was not an easy one, as his mother Bessie would die when he was only three months old. Bessie contracted tuberculosis pleurisy during pregnancy. Fred was very distraught about the death of his wife that he found himself unable to care for his newborn son and older daughter Winifred. So rather than allow the children to suffer, he sent Winifred to live with her grandparents and Graham to live with his sister Winnie and her husband Jack. For the next two years, Graham lived with his aunt and uncle growing very close to them as if they were his own parents. But in 1950, Fred got remarried to a woman named Molly. Fred wanted his children to be a part of his new life. So the children were uprooted from their homes and placed in a new environment with their father and stepmother. This move caused visible signs of distress in Graham. He developed extreme separation anxiety. Not only was he displaced from the only home he knew, but also his only parental figures. This seemed to become the foundation for the peculiar child Graham would soon flourish into. Growing up, he took up solitary hobbies and became almost reclusive with his peers. He loved to read books and really nurtured his curiosity with works of nonfiction and tales of murder. It was through reading he found his favorite subject to study a man by the name of Holly Harvey Crippen, better known as Dr. Crippen. Dr. Crippen was an infamous poisoner who murdered his wife in 1940, so he could be with his mistress without hassle. Graham was fascinated with the chemistry behind poisons and their different effects. By the time he was a teenager, he was well-versed in the subjects of chemistry, forensics, and toxicology. He excelled in all of the sciences offered in school, but the coverage was very limited on what was taught. In order to advance his already vast knowledge on the subjects, he took to a lot of extracurricular reading. Fred saw his son's passion for the subject and felt he should cultivate his thirst for knowledge, and did so by purchasing a chemistry set for Graham. Graham was thrilled with this new hobby, spending hours perfecting his own experiments. He was so involved with it that the children at school began to dub him the Mad Professor. In 1959, Graham passed his 11 plus, an exam given the last year of primary education, and went on to grammar school, which is an academically oriented secondary school. Graham was always odd, but during this time, he really developed some weird tendencies. He gained an unhealthy obsession with Adolf Hitler. He went as far as decorating his clothing with swastikas and spouting the virtues of a misunderstood Adolf to anyone willing to listen. He also plunged into works of the occult, claiming to have knowledge of local Wiccans. He partook in occult ceremonies which involved sacrificing animals. He supposedly tried to involve the local children as well. By age 13, Graham was very proficient in the workings of toxicology. With this knowledge, he convinced the Arius chemist that he was actually 17. Through these connections, he acquired varying quantities of several poisonous substances for the purpose of studying. Among these were the chemicals antimony, digitalis, arsenic, and thallium. 
He spent a lot of time studying these chemicals, but decided he needed real test subjects to understand their true potential. He picked his first subject, a fellow science student by the name of Christopher Williams. Graham began to administer small traces of the chemical antimony into drinks and food that he offered to share with Christopher. These trace amounts caused severe illness for the boy. He began suffering from periods of vomiting, painful cramps, and headaches. Christopher's mysterious illness caused him to be out of school a lot, which didn't help curb Graham's scientific curiosity. Luckily, Christopher survived despite there being no clear diagnosis provided by doctors. Graham, however, was just starting and chose subjects in which he had unlimited access to. In 1961, the young family began to show similar symptoms, completely unaware that they were the victims of minute poisoning. Molly was the first to begin complaining of stomach cramps and bouts of pain, but she was not alone. Soon, Fred and Winifred shared similar concerns. On occasion, Graham displayed the symptoms as well. It is unclear if this was on purpose, out of interest, or just plain carelessness. With the news of ill classmates, they initially thought Graham had brought home some kind of sickness. But the symptoms would come and go, and for the most part, Fred and Winifred appeared to be getting better. That was until November of that year. One morning, Winifred was up getting ready for work when Graham had given her a cup of tea. She accepted this kind gesture, but noticed it had a rather sour taste. So after her one swallow, she discarded the rest and went on her way. On the train ride to work, she began to feel wrong, and this was soon followed up with hallucinations. Winifred was taken to the nearby hospital, where the doctors discovered she had consumed belladonna extract. Belladonna, or deadly nightshade, is a poisonous plant that was commonly used during the Renaissance. Fred immediately suspected Graham of accidentally contaminating her teacup. But Graham tried to convince his father that Winifred often used the teacup for mixing shampoo. But Fred didn't buy this story, as Winifred wasn't as curious of a mind as Graham. Graham's room was searched, but no incriminating evidence was found. Rather, he took the just warning Graham to be more careful with his chemistry set. While Winifred and Fred made recoveries, Molly appeared to be getting worse. She was very sick by spring, with her hair falling out by the clumps and her body wasting away. Unbeknownst to them, Graham was continuing to poison Molly. Over the span of months, he added minor amounts of antimony to her daily cup of tea. It happened for so long that she actually built an immunity to the antimony based on Graham's notes regarding his experiment. When he noticed her condition wasn't progressing, he chose to switch her poison to thallium. The next day, April 21st, Molly was found by Fred in agonizing pain in their back garden, with Graham watching on in fascination. She was rushed to the hospital where she died later that night. Doctors ruled her cause of death from a prolapse of her spine due to a car accident a year prior. Molly was cremated and no further analysis was made. Not long after Molly's death, Fred became very ill once again. He was admitted to the hospital as well. The doctors discovered the root of his disorder, though. Fred had been poisoned with antimony, and it was suspected one more dose could have been the nail in his coffin. Fred still wasn't establishing the link of these illnesses to Graham. Now, whether this was out of ignorance or disbelief is unknown. An outsider looking in, though, noticed his precocious student. He became quite fearful of Graham's strange behavior. In May of 1962, the month after Molly died, Graham's science teacher searched his desk. 
Here he discovered several bottles of poisonous chemicals along with violent drawings depicting the death of his family. Obviously concerned, it was brought to the attention of the headmaster, who arranged for Graham to meet with a psychiatrist. After speaking to the boy, the psychiatrist suggested contacting authorities because there was something wrong with Graham. Graham Young was arrested on May 23, 1962. He confessed to poisoning his family and a classmate through his macabre experiments. He boasted to them about his thoughtful way of switching Molly's poison method to deliver her deadly dose. Even though he confessed, he wasn't charged with the murder. There wasn't enough evidence to prove that Graham had killed Molly since her body was cremated. He was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years at the Broadmoor Maximum Security Hospital, where at just 14, he became the youngest inmate. While at Broadmoor, Graham was examined by many psychiatrists who determined he suffered from a personality disorder and schizophrenia. Other analysis also suggested signs of autism. Only a few weeks after his arrival to the hospital, another inmate by the name of John Barridge suddenly died. It was determined cause of death was due to cyanide poisoning, but staff didn't suspect Graham. Even when Graham offhandedly explained cyanide could be extracted from the cherry laurel bushes surrounding the property, they just brushed him off and didn't take him serious. Instead, they ruled John had taken his own life. Years passed and Graham seemed to be getting better or just better at hiding. In June of 1970, his psychiatrist recommended he be released as they felt he was fully cured and no longer possessed a fascination with poison. Despite his father insisting he was dangerous and Graham himself revealing his grandiose plan of killing one nurse for every year he was detained, Graham was released in February 1971 at the age of 23, serving just nine years. He moved to a hostel where one of his roommates had mysteriously fallen ill. The illness nearly paralyzed the young man, but thankfully he recovered. Graham was back to his old ways, procuring his poisons from London pharmacists who were unfamiliar with him. He found work at the John Hadlin Laboratory, a photographic supply firm that manufactured infrared lenses for military equipment. It seemed almost coincidental that the main ingredient for the lenses was none other than thallium. Graham's employers knew he had a stent in Broadmoor, but didn't know why he was there. So no one suspected a thing when Graham offered to become the tea maker for the crew. They felt he was odd, but kind. And soon, a sickness swept among his colleagues and his boss, Bob Agle, who all experienced stomach cramps and dizziness. They chalked this illness up to a contagious virus known as the Bovingdon Bug. Bob seemed to have the worst case yet. He was admitted to the hospital where he succumbed to his illness on July 7, 1971. His cause of death was ruled as pneumonia. It seemed to be an epidemic, with nearly 70 people experiencing the same symptoms. Oddly, the victims seemed to improve while at home, but as soon as they returned to work, the illness would also return. The investigation into this unknown ailment didn't intensify until after the death of a second employee. Fred Biggs was deteriorating and at a fast pace like Bob did. He was admitted to the hospital where he spent two months before dying on November 19, 1971. The suspicions began to rise as to what the cause of this illness was. They researched contaminated water, radioactive fallout, or leakage of chemicals at their firm as possible culprits, but this led to nothing. The doctors assured employees that the health and safety guidelines were being followed closely. This was when Graham decided to challenge the doctors. He quizzed them on why they hadn't considered thallium poisoning since it was very deadly and consistently used at the firm. 
Graham's shocking knowledge of the chemical got management involved, who then contacted authorities about their suspicious employee. Even though they were unaware of his past, it soon came to light. Graham Young was a poisoner, and no stint in a mental hospital would change that. Graham was arrested on November 21, 1971. On his persons, authorities discovered vials of thallium. A search warrant was conducted on his home, which revealed a collection of poisonous chemicals and a detailed diary. In this diary, he kept meticulous notes on the doses administered, effects they had on his subjects, and lastly, who he chose to live and die. He made a verbal confession upon his arrest, but refused to sign a written confession, believing it gave him some kind of power. His trial began on June 19, 1972 at St. Albans Crown Court. He was charged with two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of administering poison. Graham pled not guilty to all of the charges. He was sure he would receive an acquittal. But the inclusion of his diary affected the jury, leading to a guilty conviction. He was given four life sentences. The media dubbed him the teacup poisoner due to his methods, but Graham hated this. He felt it really dumbed down what he actually did and preferred to be the world poisoner. He was sent to the maximum security at Pankhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight. Here he made friends with another infamous figure, the Moors murderer Ian Brady. The pair shared a love for Nazi Germany and chess. Graham Young was found dead in his cell on August 1, 1990, at the age of 42. The cause of death was determined to be heart failure. His fellow inmates believed the world poisoner had either gotten a taste of his own medicine or took control one last time. The notoriety of his crimes brought a much-needed light on thallium as a deadly poison. It was later used to coat missiles in future wars. The aftermath of his crimes caused a review of how poisons are distributed and sold to the public. It was also the catalyst for a review of the treatment, release, and assessment of mental patients. In 1995, a movie titled The Young Poisoner's Handbook was released. It was a dark comedy portraying the life of Graham Young. This movie brought deadly consequences, though. In 2005, a young Japanese girl had seen the movie and became obsessed with Graham. She poisoned her mother with thallium over a period of time and kept a blog documenting her every step. She idolized Graham and wanted to be just like him. In the blog, she wrote, quote, Let me introduce a book, Graham Young's Diary on Killing with Poison, the autobiography of a man I respect, end quote. The girl, who was a minor at the time, received rehabilitation since the judge believed she had developmental problems and had no ill will towards her mother, but was merely trying to experiment. Her mother fell into a coma and no updates have been provided to the case. So what did you guys think of Graham Young? Would the teacup poisoner have been born if he had never been uprooted from his aunt's house? I thought this was an interesting case because I believe, historically speaking, poison is a feminine way of murder. I'm not saying men can't or don't do it, it's just usually a woman, so it's nice to see us breaking those M.O.s. But as always, leave your thoughts and comments down below and we can chat. If you found this video interesting, please consider giving it a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And lastly, if you're not subscribed, you should. We would love to have you join us under the ash tree. Thank you all for hanging out. My viewers are the best viewers. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, friends.